Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on justice delivery and in this lecture we shall have a look at the alternate dispute redressal mechanisms. Now what is an alternate dispute redressal mechanism? We have seen that justice delivery mechanisms are primarily a way to resolve disputes, to redress the disputes. So if there is any dispute between two parties, they can go to the court of law to get a redressal of their disputes. But then is going to the court the only option? Or do we have certain alternatives to going to the court? When we talk about alternate dispute redressal mechanisms, we are talking about those mechanisms that can redress the disputes, but are an alternative to the conventional way of going to the courts. Now, why do we require alternate dispute redressal mechanisms? So, let us start thinking about it by looking at the views of two of the luminaries. The first one is Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln was the president of the United States, but he also happened to be a lawyer. He had a flourishing law practice and he also had this habit of writing about cases, writing about law, so as to guide the young people into the field. So this is what Abraham Lincoln had to say about litigation. He said, discourage litigation, persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. So you should take all opportunities to persuade the people in your surroundings to go for a compromise and not to go for a litigation. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser. So even if a person is winning a case, then too he is often a really a loser. Loser in fees, expenses and waste of time. So even if the court has given the judgment in his favor, then too he has to pay fees, he has to undergo expenses and there is a lot of wastage of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man and there will still be business enough. So even if lawyers try to discourage litigation, then too they, there will be enough business to take care of their requirements and at the same time, they will be good people. He further stated, never stir up litigation. That is, never try to bring up a litigation between two parties. A worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this. So the people who try to stir up litigation are not good people in the view of Al Abraham Lincoln and he says that you can very, uh, with very difficulty you can find a worse person than one who stirs up litigation, who can be more nearly a fiend, fiend refers to a devil, so who can be more nearly a devil than he who habitually overhauls the register of deeds in search of defects in titles, where on to stir up strife and put money in his pocket. That is, those people are devilish who are trying to look into the register of deeds, find out any mistakes and use those mistakes to stir up a strife, that is a discord and through litigation try to put money in their own pockets. A moral tone ought to be infused into the profession which should drive such men out of it. So he was even of the view that the profession of law should be such as to drive these people who are trying to stir up litigation out of the field. So here we are observing a well-renowned lawyer with a very flourishing practice who later on also became the President of the United States and he is trying to emphasize as far as possible 
to encourage people not to stir up a litigation and to try to go for peaceful settlements as far as possible. Now, that is the United States. In our country, Gandhiji also happened to be a barrister. He was also a lawyer. And Gandhiji wrote about his experiences about these alternate redressal mechanisms in his autobiography. And this is what Gandhiji had to say. What is the true function of a lawyer? So, in his autobiography, My Experiments with Truth, he says, but I do intend cultivating the acquaintance of the other party. I should like to be friends with them. I would try, if possible, to settle your case out of court. After all, Tayyab Seth is a relative of yours. So, what was happening here is that when Gandhiji went to South Africa, he went to take up the case of Abdullah Seth. And there was this case between these two cousins near relations in which there was a huge sum of money involved. And Gandhiji was brought to South Africa to litigate in this particular case. But what he is telling to his client is that let me have a word with the other party and let me try to settle this case out of the court. So, he is saying I intend to cultivate the acquaintance of the other party. I want to know the other party. I should like to be friends with them, that is with Tayyab Haji Muhammad. So, he wants to be friends with the other party. I would try if possible to settle the case out of court. After all, Tayyab said is a relative of yours. And because he is a relative, so you should not be litigating against this person, because this will lead to uh, bitter consequences. Said Tayyab Haji Khan Muhammad was a near relative of Abdullah Said. The mention of a probable settlement somewhat startled the Said, I could see. So, basically, he was taken aback because he was expecting that Gandhiji, as a lawyer, would be intent on litigation, but he is trying to settle the case out of court, and so he was startled. But I had already been six or seven days in Durban. And we now knew and understood each other. I was no longer a white elephant. And so he said, yes, I see. So, basically there is some amount of hesitation, but he is saying, yes, I see, there would be nothing better than a settlement out of court. But we are all relatives and know one another very well indeed. Tayyab said, is not a man to consent to a settlement easily. With the slightest unwariness on our part, he would screw all sorts of things out of us and do us down in the end. So, please think twice before you do anything. That is, even when Gandhiji is telling Abdullah said that let us settle it out of the court, there is a large amount of distrust. So, he is saying that my relative, he, we both of us, we know each other very well and my relative is trying to put me down. And if you give him any information, then he will misuse that information against me and will try to bring me down. Do not be anxious about that, said I. I need not talk to Tayyab Seth or for that matter to anyone else about the case. So, Gandhiji is saying that I will not talk about the case. I would only suggest to him to come to an understanding and so save a lot of unnecessary litigation. That is, Gandhiji is saying that I will just talk to Tayyab Seth, but I will not talk about the case. I will just tell him that if we come to an understanding, then we will avoid the unnecessary litigation. Dada Abdullah's was no small case. The suit was for 40,000 pounds. Arising out of business transactions, it was full of intricacies of accounts. Part of the claim was based on promissory notes and part on the specific performance of promise to deliver promissory notes. The defense was that the promissory notes were fraudulently taken and lacked sufficient consideration. There were numerous points of fact and law in this intricate case. So, as with many cases, this was a very intricate case and involved a huge amount of money, 40,000 pounds. And because of the intricacies, you had to look into it in great detail. 
both parties had engaged the best attorneys and counsel i thus had a fine opportunity of studying their work i approached tayeb said and requested and advised him to go for arbitration i recommended him to see his counsel now this is very important he requested and advised the other party to go for an arbitration so you cannot persuade the other party when we talk about an alternate dispute redressal mechanism it has to be based on the goodwill of both the parties so you cannot force anything you can just request you can just tell the other party that let us go with this mechanism and you are going to benefit from this and there is nothing to be kept secret you can even talk to your lawyers so this is what gandhi ji is saying i recommended him to see his counsel counsel is the lawyer i suggested to him that if an arbitrator co commanding the confidence of both parties could be appointed the case would be quickly finished here again it is important to note the arbitrator should be a person who commands the confidence of both the parties that is both the parties should agree that this is a good person he is going to take our side or let us say he is going to take my side or he is an impartial person so we have confidence in this person the alternate dispute redressal mechanisms will only work when both the parties have a person that they have confidence in or a group of persons that they have a confidence in so if such an arbitrator can be appointed the case will be quickly finished the lawyers fees were so rapidly mounting up that they were enough to devour all the resources of the clients big merchants as they were so even though both of these people were big merchants but the lawyers fees were going up so quickly that there was a chance that both the parties would end up with nothing the case occupied much of their attention that they had no time left for any other work so if there is a court case then there is no time left for any other work you are so much preoccupied and in the meantime mutual ill will was steadily increasing so even though both of these people were relatives but the mutual ill will was increasing and they did not have time for anything else so here again just as in the case of abraham lincoln gandhi ji is telling us what are the cons of going through litigation so ill will goes up there is no time left it is cost intensive you have to give a lot of attention so all of these are the minus points of going through the normal dispute redressal mechanisms through the court so gandhi ji further writes i became disgusted with the profession as lawyers the counsel on both sides were bound to rake up points of law in support of their own clients now the profession says that if you are a lawyer then you should bring up points of law in support of your clients even if that results in a mutual ill will a mutual distrust then too you are bound to take up these points i also saw for the first time that the winning party never recovers all the costs incurred under the court fees regulation there was a fixed scale of costs to be allowed as between party and party the actual cost as between attorney and client being much higher so this is the case in india as well the courts prescribe things such as the court fees regulations so we have things like court fees regulations that prescribe a fixed scale of cost that will be given to one party or the other party but the cost of hiring an attorney or a lawyer is much greater than what you will recover from the suit this was more than i could bear i felt that my duty was to befriend both parties and bring them together i strained every nerve to bring about a compromise at last the upset agreed an arbitrator was appointed and the case was argued before him and dada abdullah won now in this case gandhi ji knew that dada abdullah had a stronger case he had documents that proved his point 
so he could have very easily won in a court of law as well but even a strong party has incentive not to go to the courts because if you go to the courts you do not have any time or money for anything else there is only distress and you will be able to recover a very small fraction because you will have to pay huge fees to the lawyers and in this particular case gandhi ji uh, convinced both the parties to go for arbitration and out of arbitration the same result was achieved as would have been achieved if both the parties went to the court but in this case it was much faster it was much cheaper then he continues but that did not satisfy me if my client were to seek immediate execution of the award it would be impossible for tie up state to meet the whole of the awarded amount and there was an unwritten law among the poor bandar mehmans living in south africa that this should be preferred to bankruptcy so even though tayab seth was on the losing side and he had to pay a huge amount of money but he could not come up with that huge amount of money at that instant so gandhi ji says that in south africa people had this uh unwritten rule or this tendency that they wanted to avoid bankruptcy so if you are going bankrupt it's better to go for a suicide now even though gandhi ji's side had won but he wanted to bring about a fair settlement between both the parties he wanted to ensure that nobody loses so even though the arbitration award went against the upset he wanted to take his side as well so this is what he is saying it was impossible for tie up state to pay down the whole sum of about 37000 pounds and costs he meant to pay not a pile less than the amount and he did not want to be declared bankrupt there was only one way dada abdullah should allow him to pay in moderate installments he was equal to the occasion and granted tie up state installments spread over a very long period so basically in this whole process what gandhi ji is trying to do is to bring about a compromise such that both the parties are in a win win situation if they had gone to the court then after a long delay after huge amounts of fees the judgment would have been the same the court would have ruled in the favor of dada abdullah but in that case not only would dada abdullah have lost time and money and resources but at the same time because there would have been a great amount of distress between both the parties so they, he would have insisted that they have said should pay me this amount right at this instant and because they have said could not come up with that huge an amount of 37000 pounds plus costs so he would have to be declared bankrupt and probably would have killed himself so gandhi ji try to bring both the parties to a compromise and after the arbitration award went in favor of dada abdullah he persuaded dada abdullah to allow tayab seth to pay in small monthly installments so that he is able to pay and dada abdullah also agreed because at this point of time the distress was not that high as would have been if they had gone to the court so he continues it was more difficult for me to secure this concession of payment by installments than to get the parties to agree to arbitration but both were happy over the result and both rose in the public estimation my joy was boundless i had learned the true practice of law i had learned to find out the better side of human nature and to enter men's hearts i realized that the true function of a lawyer was to unite parties that have been torn apart so this is the true function of a lawyer not to create strife between the parties but to unite the parties that have been torn apart the lesson was so indelibly burnt into me that a large part of my time during the 20 years of my practice as a lawyer was occupied in bringing about private compromises of hundreds of cases i lost nothing thereby not even money certainly not my soul so as with abraham lincoln gandhi ji is also saying that even if you do this even if you try to bring about compromises even if you try to dissuade litigation 
then too you will have a large number of cases, you will have sufficient money to for survival. And so the true function of the lawyer should not be to uh, rake up this price, but to go for amicable settlements. Now this has become much more prominent today than it was in Gandhiji's time. Because if we look at our legal system, the legal system is in crisis. We have nearly 5 crore cases that are pending in Indian courts. Judges are presiding on around 40 to 50 cases every day. Now judges also require time. Judges also need to go through all the evidences that have been presented. Now if there are 40 to 50 cases that a judge has to preside over on each day, then it is no wonder that cases will linger on for a very long period of time. So this is the crisis in the Indian legal system. You have a lot of pendency, judges are presiding over huge number of cases that is leading to delays. In high courts, around 40% of cases have been pending for more than 5 years, 40% of cases. In subordinate courts, around 25% of cases have been pending for more than 5 years. There is a vacancy of around 40% for judges in high courts. The number of functional fast track courts and their pendency of cases has been going up over the years. Now, it is possible to set up these courts and more and more number of courts have been set up or are being set up every year. But the number of cases is so huge that even after setting up a large number of fast track courts, the pendency has been going up. Currently, the number of under trials, that is people who have not been declared guilty after following the due process of law, they are undergoing the trial and this number is more than two times the number of convicts in prisons. So this tells us that our state of judiciary is under a lot of pressure of cases. And so every opportunity that can be had to reduce this pendency must be availed. And a way out in this case is these alternate dispute redressal mechanisms. So what is ADR? It is a process of resolving disputes without litigation. It is an alternative to the formal legal system. So, in place of going to the courts, you can take up these processes. And we have seen one process, arbitration, as was told by Gandhiji, but we have four different ways. We have arbitration, mediation, conciliation, and judicial settlement through Lok Adalats. The objective of ADR is to ensure that opportunities for securing justice are not denied to any citizen by reason of economic or other disability. That is, when we talk about the rule of law, then it is a principle that everybody should be equal in front of law. People should have the opportunity to present their cases. People should have the capability. And this capability comes through resources. But not everybody has resources. There are people who are very poor, there are people who do not have enough time, there are people who are illiterate, who do not know about law and so on. And it is required to provide them with opportunities to secure justice, even if they have economic disability or some other disability. So ADR or alternate dispute redressal mechanisms are trying to ensure to provide justice to the people who have economic or other disabilities. And this directly comes from the constitution of India. Article 39A says, equal justice and free legal aid. The state said shall secure that the operation of the legal system promotes justice on a basis of equal opportunity and shall in particular provide free legal aid by suitable legislation or schemes or in any other way to ensure that opportunities for securing justice are not denied to any citizen by reason of economic or other disabilities. 
so you need to provide people with justice and legal aid but how are you going to provide them with these if your system is in such a huge pressure as we have seen before then article 14 says equality before law the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. Now, when we say equal protection of the laws, it means that people, whether they are rich or they are poor, whether they are literate or they are illiterate, should have the protection of law. And they are only going to get the protection of the law if they get access to the legal system. That is, they should have access to a lawyer. They should have access to a judge who has time and resources to devote to this case. And if your system is in a huge amount of pressure because of pendencies, then it will be difficult to provide these. So, ADR comes as a rescue mechanism for this as well. Article 22 1 says, no person who is arrested shall be detained in custody without being informed as soon as may be of the grounds for such arrest, nor shall he be denied the right to consult and to be defended by a legal practitioner of his choice. But then, where would a person, a poor illiterate person get a legal practitioner, if the system is all uh, full of pressures, of pendencies. So, to overcome the challenges and to provide meaning to the constitutional provisions, we require the alternate dispute redressal mechanisms, so that certain resources of the conventional judiciary gets freed and people have access to their fundamental rights. So, what are the characteristics and advantages of ADR? So, if you go for ADR in place of going through the conventional system, what is the difference? Now, the first characteristic is that ADR mechanisms can be used at any time, even after litigation starts. And they can be terminated at any stage by any of the disputing parties. When we are talking about ADR, we are talking about a mutual settlement in an amicable environment. Now, this mutual settlement can be started before the parties have gone to the court of law or even at a time when the case is going on. So, even if there is a litigation going on between two parties, the two parties can say that, okay, let us settle this dispute amongst ourselves and they can go for the ADR mechanisms. Then it is also not necessary that if somebody has gone for ADR mechanisms, then he or she has to continue with the ADR mechanisms. Any party can say that, no, I am not satisfied, so let us cancel this and let us continue with the court case. So, it can be started at any time, it can be ended at any time. So, there is a huge amount of flexibility. The freedom of parties to litigation is not curtailed by the ADR process. So, if two parties have gone for the ADR process, whether arbitration, mediation, conciliation or lokadalat, and if these parties, if any of these parties is not happy or not satisfied with the award, then they can again go for litigation. So, this freedom of parties to litigation, it is not curtailed. There is no law that says that if you have gone through the EDR process, you cannot go to the court of law. So, you still retain the right, but in most cases, what is seen is that because the parties have settled the dispute amongst themselves amicably, so they themselves forego the right. That is, they in most cases, because they have sat down together, understood each other and then came up with the settlement. So, in most cases, people just do not go to the courts any further. They are satisfied with this process. It reduces the number of contentious issues between the parties and in the legal system, because you have settled some of the contentious issues. It provides a better, faster and cheaper solution to the dispute. This is what we have seen in the case of Abdullah Said. 
so it was better because they did not have to devote their resources there was no distrust that brewed up because of the adr process it was faster they got the result very quickly and it was cheaper they did not have to pay for the lawyers the neutrals chosen are often subject matter experts of the dispute that is if there is a business dispute then in most cases the neutral third party that is selected for the process of arbitration or mediation is a person who knows the business well and unlike a judge who has to be told of all the special provisions because this person who is doing adr already knows the process so things can get much faster it keeps the dispute a private matter because you can go for the adr mechanism without going to the court so in this case there will be no media highlightments that such and such parties have gone to the court now because you can settle the dispute privately the media does not have to know if you do not go to a court in most cases media will not know and your reputation will be kept intact it promotes creative and realistic solutions as we have seen before that in the case of adr mechanism there was a provision provided that you can pay the money in installments now this was a creative solution probably this would not have been allowed by the judiciary of the day but because there was an arbitration process so it was allowed so it promotes creative and realistic solutions it is flexible it is not governed by the rigorous rules or procedures parties are free to discuss their differences of opinion without fear of disclosure of facts before a court of law this is again what we saw before that dada abdullah was very anxious that if you tell the other party about the case then they can bring these matters up in the litigation and they'll bring us down but in the case of the adr process you are free to discuss your differences of opinion without fear of disclosure of facts because in this case you do not have to bring all the documents you can just discuss the facts and you are not required to produce all the documents before the other party and so your difference of opinion can be resolved without giving them those documents that they can use against you it allows the parties to appreciate each other's perspective so for example in certain cases a might think that b has willingly defaulted on his payments and so he wants to sue b but during the adr process b can tell a that okay i did not want to default on my payments but there were such and such issues with me probably it there may be a situation that b was not healthy at that time he was suffering from a debilitating disease or that there was a huge loss in one of the other businesses of b now during this process of adr when both the parties sit together it is possible that a might appreciate b's point of view understand that b has not defaulted on his payments willingly and might be ready to give him some more time but this would not have happened if both the parties went to the court because in the court of law motive does not play a huge role so the court would have only seen that okay we had to give this payment in this time but we did not give it and so we rule in favor of a whereas in the case of adr mechanisms a can very easily understand that okay b had a genuine problem and so let me give him some more time it may be used with or without a lawyer so you can take the services of your lawyer but it is not required unlike in the court setting where a lawyer is in most cases required unless you are taking your case yourself but in this case both the parties may decide okay let us just sit together and look at the uh, uh, at our differences of opinion there is no need to consult a lawyer here it reduces the workload of courts permitting them to focus on other cases so there are certain cases 
that can be solved through ADR mechanisms and there are certain other cases that have to go to the courts. Now, if you reduce the burden by taking away those cases that can be solved through ADR mechanisms away from the courts, then courts have much better time and resources to devote to those cases that have no other option. It creates a win-win situation for both the parties. So, both the parties are happy. Often no appeal lies, reducing the burden of appellate courts. So, even though people can go to the courts, but often it turns out that no, that appeal is not required and in certain cases the uh, award is considered to be final and so there is no appeal at all. So, what are the legal provisions for ADR? Section 89 of the Civil Procedure Code 1908 says, settlement of disputes outside the court, where it appears to the court that there exist elements of a settlement which may be acceptable to the parties, the court shall formulate the terms of settlement. When it says the court shall formulate, it means that the court has to formulate the terms of settlement. There is no option before the court. The only thing is, it should appear to the court that there are elements of settlement which may be acceptable to the parties and if these exist, then the court has to formulate the terms of settlement and give them to the parties for their observations and after receiving the observation of the parties, the court may reformulate the terms of a possible settlement and refer the same for arbitration, conciliation, judicial settlement including settlement through Lok Adalat or mediation. So, what section 89 1 is saying is that the court, if it appears to the court that a settlement is possible, then the court has to formulate the terms of settlement, give it to the parties and after, listen to the parties about their observations and based on that reformulate the terms of a possible settlement and refer the same for these ADR mechanisms. So, it has a legal backing. Where a, uh, where a dispute has been referred for arbitration or conciliation, the provisions of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996 shall apply as if the proceedings for arbitration or conciliation were referred for settlement under the provisions of that act. So, we have this act called the Arbitration and Conciliation Act that deals with arbitration and conciliation and if the court refers uh, the matter for arbitration or conciliation, then the process will be governed by this act. If it is sent to Lok Adalat, the court shall refer the same to the Lok Adalat in accordance with the provisions of subsection 1 of section 20 of the Legal Services Authority Act 1987 and all other provisions of that act shall apply in respect of the dispute, so refer to the Lok Adalat. So, if the case is sent to a Lok Adalat, then this act, the Legal Services Authority Act 1987 is going to govern it. For mediation, now in this for C and D, C said judicial settlement, but then the Supreme Court uh, in this matter of Afcon's Infrastructure Limited said that we should read it as mediation and in this case in place of mediation, we should read it as judicial settlement. So, the Supreme Court said that there has been a typo in drafting this act. So, for mediation, the court shall refer the same to a suitable institution or person and such institution or person shall be deemed to be a Lok Adalat and all the provisions of the Legal Services Authority Act 1987 shall apply as if the dispute were referred to a Lok Adalat under the provisions of that act. So, if there is a mediation, then the court shall refer the same to a suitable institution or person. So, the mediation will be done by any suitable institution or any person who is suitable and the process will be governed by this act. And for judicial settlement, the court shall effect a compromise between the parties and shall follow such procedure as may be prescribed. So, basically the ADR mechanisms have a very big legal backing when it comes to the CPC. Now, let us look at the ruling of the Honorable Supreme Court in this case AFCON's Infrastructure Limited and another 
versus Cherry and Varki Construction Company. The Supreme Court notes that Section 89 starts with the words where it appears to the court that there exist elements of a settlement. This clearly shows that cases which are not suited for ADR process should not be referred under Section 89 of the court. It means that the courts should not refer each and every case for the ADR mechanism, but should take a look on whether or not these cases are suitable for the ADR mechanism. The court has to form an opinion that a case is one that is capable of being referred to and settled through the ADR process. Only in certain recognized excluded categories of cases, it may choose not to refer to an ADR process. So, there are certain categories of cases, we will look at them in a short while. And in these cases, the court can choose not to refer to the ADR process. Where the case is unsuited for reference to any of the ADR process, the court will have to briefly record the reasons for not resorting to any of the settlement procedures prescribed under section 89 of the code. So, if the court chooses that we are not going to refer this case to the ADR process, the court has to briefly record the reasons why it is not sending it for the ADR process, what forms the basis of its decision. Therefore, having a hearing after completion of pleadings to consider recourse to ADR process under section 89 of the code is mandatory. So, the court has to mandatorily have a hearing after completion of the pleadings to consider whether it can be sent to the ADR process or not. But actual reference to an ADR process in all cases is not mandatory. Where the case falls under an excluded category, there need not be reference to the ADR process. In all other cases, reference to ADR process is a must. So, what the Supreme Court is saying here is that for any case that can be solved through or referred to the ADR process, it should be referred to the ADR process. The court does not have to send all the cases for ADR, but it is mandatory for the court to at least devote some time and hearing to evaluate whether ADR is suitable or not. That is a mandatory process. So, let us now look at the the ADR processes one by one, beginning with arbitration. So, we have looked at arbitration before in the Dada Abdullah case. Now, let us understand the theory and process of arbitration. Now, arbitration is a procedure for the resolution of disputes on a private basis through appointment of an arbitrator. <coughs> so, the parties go for a resolution of disputes on a private basis through appointment of an arbitrator. So, this is what Gandhiji was referring to before as well, that if a suitable arbitrator can be found that has respect of both the parties. So, this is what is being referred to here. So, privately both the parties can agree on a suitable arbitrator and use that the services of that arbitrator for the resolution of their disputes on a private basis. The arbitrator is an independent, neutral third person who hears and considers the merits of the dispute and renders a final and binding decision called an award. The important words here are final and binding decision called an award. Now, in the case of Gandhiji's case, the arbitrator ruled in favor of Dada Abdullah and gave the awards that was 37,000 pounds plus costs. So, what the arbitrator is doing is, he or she is hearing the cases similar to the court, but in place of uh, the, the normal court, this is a third party that has been selected by both the parties. And after hearing the, the case completely, he comes up with a judgment and he gives an award. He renders a final and binding decision. So, once you have gone through arbitration, you will come up with a decision that will be final and binding on both the parties. And this decision is known as the award. 
So, it is very similar to the normal judicial process. The scope of the rules for the arbitration process are set out broadly by the provisions of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. In areas uncovered by the statute, the parties are free to design an arbitration process appropriate and relevant to their disputes. So, if the parties consider that they require a separate arbitration process and there are certain areas that are not covered by the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, then the parties are free to design their own arbitration process. Once the process is decided upon and within the parameters of the statute, the arbitrator assumes full control of the process. The advantages are savings in time, savings in money, limited possibility for changing the award, which leads to lower costs and finality of the outcome because the award is final. Now, there is a limited possibility, there is, it does not say there is no possibility of change, challenging the award. The parties can always go to the courts after the arbitration process, but the opportunities or the possibilities become limited. There is a greater participation by the parties than is the case in the courts or the tribunal system. Now, this arbitration may be ad hoc, that is the parties may decide at any point of time that let us go for the arbitration process or it may be contractual, that is the while making the contract, the parties can write there that in case of any disputes, we will solve them through the arbitration mechanism. It can be institutional. So, there are certain institutes that specialize in this process of arbitration and these uh, and the services of these institutes may be availed for the arbitration process or it may be statutory, meaning that it may be written in a law that such and such disputes will have to go through the arbitration process. So, arbitration may be ad hoc, contractual, institutional or statutory. Now, there are certain disputes that have been excluded from the arbitration act. So, these disputes cannot be sent for arbitration. Things like matters involving questions about validity of a will. It has to be decided by a court nor not through an arbitration council. Relating to the appointment of a guardian pertaining to criminal proceedings. So, you cannot put a criminal proceeding through the process of arbitration. Relating to charitable trusts, winding up of a company, matters of divorce or restitution of conjugal rights, disputes arising from an illegal contract, insolvency matters such as adjudication of a person as an insolvent and matters falling within the purview of the Competition Act 2002. So, all of these matters cannot be sent for arbitration process. Next, we have the process of conciliation. Conciliation is a private informal process in which a neutral third person helps disputing parties reach an agreement. Now, in the case of arbitration, we saw that there is a judgment, there is an award that is given. But in the process of conciliation, it does not provide an award, it just tries to resolve the dispute. So, the process helps the disputing parties reach an agreement. Here, agreement is important, award is not important. So, award is not given, only the parties are helped to reach an agreement. And it is a private informal process. Here again you have a neutral third person that is helping the disputing parties reach an agreement. Resolution of disputes is achieved by compromise or voluntary agreement. In contrast to arbitration, the conciliator does not render a binding award. The parties are free to accept or reject the recommendations of the conciliator. So, the, the conciliator is going to help these parties reach an agreement, but the parties can reject all the recommendations of the conciliator, it is not binding. So, nothing is binding in conciliation, whereas in the case of arbitration, there was an award that was binding. The conciliator is in the Indian context 
often a government official whose report contains the recommendations and part 3 of the arbitration and conciliation act 1996 deals with conciliation the process is sometimes considered synonymous to mediation and mediation is non statutory conciliation that is because conciliation is being dealt with under this act but mediation is not being dealt with so we can say that mediation and conciliation are very similar processes but mediation is non statutory conciliation so what is mediation it is an informal process in which a neutral third party without the power to decide or usually to impose a solution helps the parties resolve a dispute or plan a transaction so you can see that nearly everything is the same as that of conciliation but the only thing is that mediation is not governed by the arbitration and conciliation act mediation is voluntary and non binding although the parties may end may enter into a binding agreement as a result of mediation and the parties arrive at an equitable solution through negotiations leading to a win win situation so unlike arbitration that gives a binding award the processes of conciliation and mediation try to go for an agreement or a compromise between both the parties and conciliation is statutory process it is governed by the arbitration and conciliation act but mediation is a non statutory process which is not governed by the arbitration and conciliation act next let us have a look at lok adalat now lok adalat is a forum where disputes or cases pending in the court of law or at pre litigation stage are settled or compromised amicably so what sort of cases can go to lok adalat the disputes or cases that are either pending in the court or that have not yet reached into the court they are at a pre litigation stage these cases can be referred to a lok adalat lok adalats have statutory status under the legal services authorities act 1987 so there is a law the legal services authorities act that gives the lok adalats a statutory status the award or decision made by the lok adalats is deemed to be a decree of a civil court and is final and binding on all parties and no appeal against such an award lies before any court of law so the lok adalats are deemed to be civil courts their awards or decisions are deemed to be decrees of civil court and just like a decree of a civil court they are final and binding and the parties cannot appeal against this this decision but they can always start the process of litigation if they are not satisfied so if the parties are not satisfied with the award of the lok adalat they are free to initiate litigation by approaching the court of appropriate jurisdiction by filing a case by following the required procedure in exercise of their right to litigate that is if the parties are not satisfied with the decision of the lok adalat they cannot appeal against that decision but they have to start a fresh case in the court having the appropriate jurisdiction so their right to litigation is not curtailed but no appeal lies then there is no court fee that is payable when a matter is filed in a lok adalat there is no court fees and if a matter pending in the court of law is referred to the lok adalat and is settled subsequently the court fee originally paid in the court on the complaints or petition is also refunded back to the parties so basically the system is trying to incentivize the lok adalats by saying that you don't have to pay a court fees and if you have already paid a court fees and your matter is referred to the lok adalat and it gets settled then the court fees will be refunded back to you the persons deciding the cases in the lok adalats are called the members of lok adalat they are not called judges they are called members of lok adalat they have the role of statutory conciliators only and do not have any judicial roles so they are basically doing the process of conciliation nature of cases to be referred to lok adalat any case pending before any court or any dispute which has not been brought before any court and is likely to be filed before the court provided that 
any matter relating to an offence not compoundable under law shall not be settled in a lok adalat. That is, you can only send those cases that are compoundable cases. That is, those cases in which you can pay a sum of money in lieu of settling the case. Now, legal service, uh, National Legal Service Authority or NALSA was constituted as a statutory body on 5th of December 95 under the legal uh, under the National Legal Services Authorities Act 1986 as amended by the Act of 1994. So, this is a body that was constituted under the National Legal Services Authorities Act and this body NALSA is engaged in providing legal services, legal aid and speedy justice through Lok Adalats. Now, we have seen before that the constitution states that people should be given legal aid, at times free legal aid. So, this is the purview of this body, NALSA. It provides legal services, legal aid and also speedy justice through Lok Adalats. The authority has its office at New Delhi and is headed by the Chief Justice of India, who is the ex officio patron in chief. Then not only at the national level, you also have state legal services authorities that have been constituted in every state capital. Then you have district legal services authorities that are headed by the district judge of the district. And you also have taluk legal services committees that are headed by a senior civil judge. So, we, we can observe that there is a, a big hierarchy or a big system at national, state, district and taluk levels. And these uh, bodies are headed by judges that deal with the civil matters. So, in this lecture, we have seen that we have different mechanisms of alternate dispute redressals such as arbitration, conciliation, mediation and lok adalats. And primarily the function of an ATR mechanism is to settle the disputes amicably. So, it provides a solution that is faster, cheaper and in most cases it is a constructive solution that leads to a win-win situation. So, as far as possible these mechanisms should be used. So, that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.